Welcome back from this morning service. We're glad to have you again this Lord's Day evening. And we talked about the Lord's Day this morning. It's still the Lord's Day, and we need to recognize that and appreciate that and be thankful for it, that this is the first day of the week. And that first day represents great things for all of us, the great things we have in Jesus Christ, our great hope that we have, and we should all love that and appreciate that day by day. Uh, we have been talking, uh, the last two Sunday nights, we've been talking about God's pruning. We're not really going on with that theme, although it may kind of be up there at the title some. But I want to spend the rest of uh, this last thought on this particular topic, talking about the fruit aspect of it. God is pruning with the idea in mind that we would bear much fruit. Now, in John chapter 15, we have the text of the vine and the branches. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He had said that God is the vine dresser. His father is the vine dresser. He is the vine that, Je that God used to grow and uh, accomplish things. The branches are those who follow Jesus Christ and are in Christ. In order to, for this to work, Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. We all understand that fruit is born by a branch that's attached to the vine. There's no other way that it could bear fruit. You can't cut it loose and it bear fruit on its own. That's an impossibility. So we have to be in Christ to bear fruit. And we have to stay. We have to abide in Christ. The word abide just means to dwell in like you live in a house. You have to abide in Christ in order for this to happen. But the emphasis that he says is that we bear much fruit. I think God is looking for a lot of fruit to be born by his people. And good fruit, of course, is what God wants to bear. I want to look with, a few, with you at a few passages that talk about that fruit and what that significance is for our life. In other words, what is God saying the fruit is that we bear? And I probably, there's probably no way I could call to your mind everything that's connected with this subject because it has to do with everything we are as Christians. But looking at some specific passages, in Romans chapter 7, at verse 4, he says, Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. Well, the point that he's making, and if you read the whole context, you'd see a little bit more of this. But the point that he's making is that our relationship with Christ is one like a marriage. That we are married to Christ. We are dead to the law and we owe it no obligations anymore. He's talking to those that were clinging to the law back in that day and time. And he's saying we're now dead to that and we don't attach ourselves to that any longer. He compares it again to marriage and says, you know, it's like the first husband dies and then you're free to marry another. Well, he said, we are free now because we are dead to the law and that we are married to another and that another is Jesus Christ, to him who, raised, who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. So that's clearly saying our job is to bear fruit to God. First, we understand that part of the bearing of fruit to God involves the responsibility of a commitment to Jesus Christ that rivals a marriage commitment. Now stop and think about that. In this context, he says that we are married to another. We are married to Jesus Christ. And that in that relationship, of course we're talking about a spiritual marriage, not a physical one, but in that relationship, we must live in a dedicated fashion. We must live with absolute commitment, that we must not be half-hearted about that commitment, that we cannot be a good marriage partner. And we're familiar with other passages, like in Ephesians 5, where it presents, G, uh, presents the church as like being like a bride to a husband or a wife to a husband. 
uh, so we are to Christ. And so that, that idea plays through Old and New Testaments, the concept of our relationship with God being like a marriage and our relationship with Christ being the same way. But we are to bear fruit by being committed to him. You know, James talks about that we must not become adulteresses. And when he says that, he's not talking about physical adultery at all. He's talking about spiritual adultery. He said, you adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that friendship with the world is enmity with God. To be married to Jesus Christ means to break the friendship with the world and be legitimately, fully dedicated to Jesus Christ. We cannot have it both ways. We cannot love both Christ and the world. And to do otherwise, he says, is as if it is the idea of, well, do we not have a PowerPoint? I think we can wing this. I'm not sure why we don't. It possibly is because the projector's not on. But I wondered why Jason had been standing there staring at me, but I couldn't think of anything that was wrong. But nevertheless, it's a serious thought, isn't it, to stop and think your commitment to Christ. Now, we all understand our commitment here is serious and that to be committed to Christ suggests the idea of a relationship with him where we love him, we appreciate him, and that we understand that we wouldn't want to be married to another, that he is one that is true to us and that we long to be true to him and that that's the situation we ought to have. I'm proposing to you the first point that we can make about bearing fruit to God is making up your mind, my mind, all of our minds that I want to be his and his only. I want to belong to God. I want him to be my priority. I want my Savior to be my priority. And I want all these other things to co take a distant back seat to be nearer the bottom of my list than anywhere rivaling my relationship with God. That, to me, is a part of bearing fruit. And I don't think we're ever going to bear much fruit until we feel that way, until God is a bigger priority to us than anything else. And let me tell you why. Every time we show more attention to the things of the world from a worldly standpoint, I'm not talking about paying your taxes and working hard at your job. I'm just say, saying when we let worldliness lure us away or a love for this present life to lure us away, to God, he views it as if we are kind of as if we were cheating because, again, friendship with the world puts us in a situation where we are adulterous with God. We can't have it again both ways. How important it is to realize that. Let's look at another fruit. There are works that need to be done. This is probably in a grand surprise, but there are works that need to be accomplished. Some of those works involve going to church, singing our songs of praise, prayer, and things of that nature. Some of it have to do with our responsibilities that we can show towards other Christians to be helpful to them, to be sympathetic to them, to rejoice with them at other times when there's cause of rejoicing, to do things that, that you know, feed those that are, are in need of being fed, take care of those, visiting in the hospital, things like that. These are things that we can do. Most of us can. We're able to do that. There may be some that just simply can no longer do that because of the advancement of age. Whatever it may be that fits into the category of a worthwhile and good work, we're told in Titus chapter 3, verse 14, let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs, that they may not be unfruitful. There's a time and the place. You know, it's interesting to me. In Galatians, he's talking to Christians. And telling them, you know, like, he really compares it to the sowing of seed. But he, he cautions us not to be weary of well-doing. And that there are deeds that we can be doing, but we need to be careful that we don't just kind of get real tired of that. We need to understand that there are good things that we can be doing and fulfill those responsibilities. 
One of the things that he said there in Galatians is, as you have the opportunity, do good. We all understand that I can't solve everybody's problem in the world, and I, I can't feed everybody in the world, and I, I can't necessarily visit every sick person there is to visit. We all understand there's a certain amount of limitation to what you can and can't do. Nobody's saying you have to do everything. But opportunities, and that's where I focus in that passage, as you have opportunity, do good to all men. When an opportunity arises that you can do something worthwhile for somebody else, then do it. That won't come every moment of every day. It won't come in every situation. Sometimes you don't have opportunity because you don't have the resources. Sometimes you have another commitment to somebody else that you, you just can't fulfill that right then. We all understand that. But when you have the opportunity, and that's a, you know, an occasion presents itself, and I, I have the wherewithal to do that, then do something about it. Maintain good works. Um, of course, James talks about works, and he, so he said that our faith without works is dead. He kind of used practical things to prove that point. But the, the bottom line is there's not much to our life as Christians. There's not much fruit bearing going on if the Lord can't see within us good works. He says, otherwise, if we fail in this department, we will be unfruitful. That is, we won't have borne to God the very things he needed us to do, to make not just the world a better place. That's not the whole idea. It's the concept of doing things that bring glory and honor to Almighty God. That's one of the greatest things about it. When, when Jesus talked about letting your light shine, he, he said that, that your Father may be glorified. We're not seeking glory for ourselves. We're not trying to get attention for us. But that these kind of things brings glory to Almighty God. And that people will be thankful that there are people that, that act on godly principles and, and in godly ways. Knowledge is something else that is a, that's in biblically a fruit to be born. What I mean by that is the Lord expects this coming from our lives. He expects our knowledge to expand and to grow about spiritual things. He wants us to come to a better understanding. In Colossians chapter 1, Paul wrote it, verse 10, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, which kind of combines, you know, something we saw just a minute ago, the last point we made, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Fruitfulness in our life not only increases our good works, bears more good fruit for God like that, but also is making, uh, uh, it's involved in the, our knowledge of the things of God, our knowledge about God, God's wisdom, God's will, God's son, God's church, everything you want to say about it that is God's, that's presented in the word of God, that's fruit bearing. That comes from a study of God's word, a personal study and a congregational study and a class study. These kind of things help us get wiser in the things of God, more filled with understanding. Those kind of things truly please God when we increase in our knowledge and our understanding of his will. God is wanting you and I to bear fruit. And not one of us ever ought to be satisfied with our knowledge. This is always something that we've got to increase in. We've got to work at. We've got to improve on for God to be glorified and for good fruit to be born. There's something else, too, that God wants us to bear, and that's worship. The sacrifice of praise to God. Look again. By him, by Christ, let us continually offer up the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips. Did you ever think about your lips and what you put into worship? Did you ever stop and think about that that bears fruit to God? That God thinks of that as fruit being born for him. That people who are praising and worshiping and offering uh, sacrifices of praise to God are bearing fruit fruit to his name. Don't you think that one reason that is, that's a far better use of our minds and our hearts and, and our bodies 
isn't it a far better thing to worship him than many other things that we could be doing? Just stop and think about that for a minute. Think of other ways we talk and communicate in this world, other things we engage in in life. People have hobbies, and that's fine. People have work, and that's important. People do a lot of other things recreationally. But what could you do that's more important than lifting up your voice and praising God? What could you accomplish more than something that God is honored by in worship? That's one of the greatest things that the human being can do. I believe that worship shows man's highest level in that he does what nothing else in this life can do. Animals, you know, I guess they have a degree of thought pattern. I guess they can accomplish things, you know, that maybe physically we can't accomplish. But one thing that separates us from the animals is we worship. We have the ability to worship. We have the thought process that allows us to consider the works of God and praise him. The psalmist said in Psalm 103, he said, I will not forget all of his benefits towards me. In his act of worship, he said, I don't want to forget what God has done for my life, what God has helped me accomplish, what God has done in making a plan for my salvation. This is a part of worship. It's understanding that God is worthy. We're about to approach two chapters in the book of Revelation after we get through with the seven churches. And uh, what goes on in those two chapters is no deep, dark secret. It's no hidden scenario for all of the, you know, history to come in the New Testament era, our era. But chapters four and five of the book of Revelation go into great detail to show that one of the things that heaven knows is that God is worthy of worship. And there's an important scene in the heavenly perspective of chapter 4. In chapter 4, there are 24 elders encircling the throne of God. There are four living creatures. You say, I don't understand any of that. Well, a lot of us don't understand fully what all those are. But they're the inhabitants of heaven. And you know what they're doing? They're praising God. They're honoring him. They're shouting out his worthiness. You know one of the most majestic scenes I've ever found? All of these have crowns. All of them wear a crown. And you know what it says that they did? They took off their crowns and they cast it before him and said, Thou art worthy. That's worship. That's taking off our earthly crowns, our earthly thoughts, our earthly ways, the things we're feeling in this life, and casting them down for a period of time and say, I want to focus on God. I don't want to come up here and talk about Pat. I don't want to come up here and think about my problems, my issues, my you know, pleasures or anything else. I want to talk about God. I want us to get focused. You know, I mentioned chapter 5 of Revelation. It does the same exact thing nearly for Jesus. And you know what all of them say in heaven? Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Really, both texts pronounce worthy or worth. And you've probably heard me say this before, but that's where our English word worship comes from. The W-O-R in worship comes from the same root as the W-O-R in worthy, and it means you realize someone is worthy. You worship because they are worthy. Worthy. And those two chapters show us that. And in a time when Christians were being tempted to worship other things, and Paul prayed to idolatry, and Paul prayed to, to emperor worship and things like that, they needed a good reminder that God is the one we worship. Jesus Christ is who we worship. We bow down at their feet and they are worthy. And they are worthy to receive all honor and glory. But not man. Man doesn't belong in that category. And we need to respect that. But remember, that means we are bearing fruit to God because we grasp that point. We understand I'm doing more than just taking the Lord's Supper. I'm doing more than just 
saying a prayer or singing a song, I am worshiping Almighty God and declaring the worth of Him and His Son and the Holy Spirit. Another way we bear fruit to God is by ongoing growth. I want to read to you from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. You're probably familiar with this text in 2 Peter. This is where it's the add to. It's the sometimes called the Christian graces. It's, uh, it, it, it builds a ladder of different qualities that we should have in our lives. But he says, for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, and he begins the series of things, supply, 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 add this, make this part of your life. Now, where I'm going with all of this, and you'll see, because I'm going to kind of talk, stop and talk about some of these things for a moment. But in a minute, he's going to say later in the verse that if you do these things, you won't be unfruitful. So turn that around. We will be fruitful to God. We will be bearing fruit if we do these. So personal growth in spiritual matters will bring fruit to Almighty God. You may wonder, well, what does God care? You know, I, I may not be able to go across the ocean and, and uh, convert a bunch of souls over here in, you know, in Nigeria or go, down to, go over to China or go down to South America somewhere. I, I may not can do all of that. Maybe I'm not equipped to do all of that. All right, th that's fine. But there is, are ways that you can grow your life and become more pleasing in God's sight. There's fruit to be born that way. And I'm not minimizing the, the, the role or idea of trying to convert people as a part of the bearing of fruit. But one of the things that God wants is you to save you, first and foremost. Get you saved by getting your life under the, uh, 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 the, the ability to follow God's way and to bear the kind of fruit. So some of that fruit that he talks about is a diligence about our faith and, uh, and adding to or supplying to our faith. And then he, here's, where he, here's what he tells us. Add moral excellence. Add a virtue, which is another way of describing it, that looks at the situation, and I strive to be morally excellent, that I want to be of the highest moral standards that you can be. Boy, you talk about an age where righteousness and morality and moral issues are dumbed down. We're living in it right now. People have no concept anymore of the idea of morality. And here as Christians, we're not just merely saying do some nice good things. He's saying make your morality excellent. Live to the highest standard you can live. Let's, let's, don't, let's don't be the kind of people that are happy with, you know, I, I hate to put it this way because I'm not so sure God gives D's and C's, but why would you want a C from God if you could have an A? Why would you want to, to present God something kind of halfway when you could give him all the way? Let's give him our absolute best. Let's give him the best life that we know how to lead, filled with moral excellence. Let's, let's don't compromise that issue. Let's don't, you know, for any sake, Strive to present him anything less than the very best we can give him. Let's add knowledge. We'll skip that one since we already talked about that God is expecting a growth in our knowledge. In your knowledge, add self-control. Don't you imagine that God is getting tired of hearing people say, well, I, I do that, I commit that sin or this sin or whatever, that's just the way I am. I can't help it. That's why God said we've got to add self-control. Of course, that's the way I am. I came into Christ, though pardoned, I came into a Christ as a person that has not lived by God's standard holy. Okay, maybe in my other life, before I became a Christian, maybe I used vulgar language. Maybe I lost my temper all the time and, and, and just was an angry person. Maybe I was an adulterer. Uh, maybe I was a homosexual. Maybe I was, you know, an arrogant person. Maybe I was a person that was a thief out here. Maybe I did those things before I became a Christian. But instead of saying, oh, well, 
poor thing you were born that way. How about less understanding the concept of self-control? That as a Christian, God expects me to bear fruit by saying, I'm not going to live that way anymore. And just even because I might be somewhat tempted to act out these things, I will not because I am, I am putting God in charge. But in a sense, I can't just, you know, that's a little bit of a cop out because somebody says, well, God just kind of let me get away with this. No, self-control means what it says. You have to exercise this. We've got to stop this business of saying, well, I've got this problem. I'm, I'm tempted to alcohol or whatever. Maybe you are. I'm not saying you're not. What I'm saying is that self-control means get that under control and quit doing that anymore. Let's stop that because you can have self-control. One of the things that I, I guess shocks me and at the same time it doesn't it is, uh, it, well, it's kind of like the issue of, of, uh, uh, of educating our young people about sexual immorality and things like that. And I understand only a certain number of things could probably be taught in the public school system. But some have said, well, you know, we don't need to be teaching abstinence. Mostly they'll say it doesn't work. You ever stop to think about that, that when we talk about whether it's drugs or, or those kind of things like sexual immorality or whatever, some people belittle the concept of just say no. Their idea is, well, you can't tell a person that. Why can't we tell a person that? Why can't you say, no, I will not engage? Joseph said it. Why can't we know it? No, I'm not, I, I won't do it. I, I doesn't have anything to do with whether that sounds a little bit tempting. No, I will not do it. Self-control. Getting control over our lives, our emotions, our ways, our sins, our temptations. Getting that under control. God wants you to bear a fruit called perseverance. You know, we were talking earlier about being thinking of our relationship with Christ like a marriage commitment. On par with that really more important than your earthly marriage commitment in a way. How many people want a marriage commitment from a partner who says, I'm only temporarily committed? Well, that doesn't sound too good. I don't think you're going to have much of a marriage if it's a temporary commitment. God says, I want perseverance. Perseverance means I'm here tomorrow, too. Perseverance means I'm in it for the long haul. I'm in it till the end. Now, I don't mean an arrogance like I, I could never fall or something like that. I'm just talking about perseverance means that we make up our mind, I'm, I'm with this thing all the way. I want to go to the grave being a Christian. I want to go to the grave being faithful to God. I don't want to get away from this. Perseverance means stickability. And we need to understand that's a fruit as God looks at it. God looks at something like that and says, that's what I'm talking about. Bear that. By the way, I'm not covering it tonight, but some of these same things are on the list of the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, Self-control is on that list. And things like that. In other words, we're dealing with similar concepts on both lists. It's a fruit to be born to God. Godliness. A, a Godward direction in our life, or devoutness about our relationship with God. That's kind of the idea behind it. It, it, it really pr nearly about is a synonym of the idea of a devoutness towards God. I know that we all kind of have through the years, uh, I did for a long time, virtually equate, uh, uh, equated godliness with righteousness. And I, I don't disagree with that, but the word conveys the idea of devoutness towards God. I am devout towards the Father. And, and, and devout suggests the idea of committed and devoted and, and, and that this is what my life is all about. And so godliness suggests a devotion to Almighty God that is intense. And, and this is my life. And this is what I'm about. And that this is the most important thing to me, my God, and my relationship with Him. Add to these kind of things, he says, brotherly kindness. One of the fruits that God is seeking to be born is a relationship between brethren. 
of looking at each other and thinking, that is my brother in Christ. And that I love them and I care about them and I care about their souls. I care about whether they go to heaven or not. And that that leads me to a godly kind of kindness that seeks to do them good and loves them like a family member should be loved. And then to that brotherly kindness, God expects us to bear the ultimate fruit of love, which is the kind of love he's talking about in 1 Corinthians 13 when he gives us all of those different things that he says love is and love is not and shows us how love has to behave. Listen, folks, this is fruitful. Every one of those things will yield you fruitful if you add that to your life. So wouldn't you say that personal growth in those kind of things is one of the ways God would have us to bear fruit? Now listen to him. If those qualities are yours in increasing, that's another important thing now, they're not only yours, but they're meant for us to continue to build in our lives with these qualities. They will render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Growth. God's looking for it. Tell you what, brethren, it, it's, we were talking about that pruning business. And one of the things Jesus talked about is, I've got to get fruit out of this plant or it, it's not going to accomplish anything. I've got to cut it down if there's no fruit. Look, look with me. If anyone does not abide in me, he's a, he is thrown away like a branch and dries up. They gather those up and they cast them into the fire and they are burned. We were talking about pruning, and again, I don't really want to get back into all that again, but I will say this, I'd rather endure God's pruning than hell's burning. I'd rather have something cut off of my life that doesn't need to be there than to face eternity in hell. This is a scary proposition. Jesus said, if it's a branch that is not in me, I'll take that branch and throw it into the fire and it'll be burned. Remember what was said in the days of John the Baptist? John told the people, said even now, really think he's talking about national Israel, but he said even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore everyone, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So it's not just once the scripture says it, it's actually several times. We've got to bear that fruit. Jesus told a parable. A man had a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and did not find any. He said to the vineyard keeper, Behold, for three years I've come looking for fruit on that fig tree without finding any. Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? Now, that's the owner. That, that, that's the one that's the, kind of be considered, in other words, in charge of it all. He says, let's go ahead and get rid of that. It's not bearing any fruit anyway. Let, let's just do away with it. Now, I want you to catch something here. Jesus, as the one in charge, the vine dresser, I guess you'd say, here this time, in this parable, it's like he steps in and said, I know, I know, I know, that, I know they've been unfruitful. But let me work on them really hard for three more years. Or a little bit longer. I don't think it's three. Yeah, let's read it. He answered and said, let it alone, sir, for this year too. So it's that one year. It's been three total. For this year too. Don't, don't do anything just yet. Let me dig around it and put fertilizer in it. And if it bears fruit next year, fine. But if not, cut it down. You ever stop to think about the ramifications of that? God says, I, I, as far as I'm concerned, it's ready to be cut down. Jesus says, in essence, I don't want to see it cut down. I want to work on it. I want to see what I can do for it. I, I want to fertilize it. I, I want to tend to it. I want to give that vine all the attention I know how to give it. And then maybe it'll bear fruit by next year. That's a beautiful thought to me, that Jesus sits back and says, let, let me do everything I know how to do for them. 
But even Jesus knows there's a point at which you just can't keep this going. And Jesus said, if it doesn't bear fruit by next year, fine, cut it down. I think, you know, that tells us something, and that is the age of grace doesn't go on forever. We're lucky. We're fortunate. We're, we're so blessed to live in the age of grace because right now something can be done. Right now it seems to me that with the church and with the Bible and, and with the relationship we can have in fellowship with each other and, and with all of heaven's blessings, it seems to me that he's pouring upon us everything that he can give to us to say, I will help them bear fruit. You know what? I've had plants like that before, and I gave them the best soil, and I gave them fertilizer, and I gave them water, and I tended to them, and they didn't do anything. They didn't grow. They didn't do anything. I got two tomato plants I got for free, and they came up. I can't honestly say I did everything I could have done for them. But I fertilized them. I watered them. I gave them good soil. And I probably had enough tomatoes to last a half a day if you had to survive with it. Now, I know my gardening skills are nothing. And I know if you put some of these other guys in charge, you'd have probably got a whole lot better out of it. But I tell you, bottom line, when it quit producing, I quit being interested. They're out there in the backyard now in the flower bed, but they aren't producing. And it's just because of convenience. I hadn't gone out there and ripped them up and thrown them into the, you know, into the woods to get rid of them. Why would I have them if they're not bearing fruit? I mean, a tomato plant isn't a beautiful thing, so why have it if it's not going to bear fruit? Is it totally dead? No, it's still kind of green, but it's not bearing any fruit. Now, Jesus goes way beyond what anybody else would, but even with him, there's a limitation to the, the age of grace. One of these days when Jesus returns, the age of grace will be over. I, I don't know what people think, that maybe Jesus will come back, hold court. I've heard of some people describe it like Jesus is going to get up there like your own personal attorney and argue with God, I'll let him off on this or that. I know he did, I know he did that, but let him off about that this time. It's not going to be that way. He's not even coming back. We're not coming back to have, a, have an official trial of some nature like that. He's coming back, really, the trial is the punishment stage. He's coming back to pronounce you know, a lost or saved and where you'll spend eternity. That's the only thing I know about it. So we're not going to have, you know, Jesus hopping up there saying, I'll defend because the age of grace is over. What, if you intend to do something, do it now while you got life. Because when you're dead, when the Lord comes back, whatever it may be, there won't be any more opportunities like that. We better get it done now because this is the age that we can have the salvation that's found in Jesus Christ. I think it's, a, in all honesty, I, I kind of think of that statement that, that, John the Bab, that Jesus said about John the Baptist, of men born of women, there's none greater than John the Baptist, but the least in the kingdom is greater than he. I take that seriously. The least in the kingdom got something John never had and could not have. That's a privilege. And that's something we ought to respect and appreciate. We live in the greatest age. We really live, though it's, I, you know, I'm not at all happy with the times of the morality of the age. We, we live in an age where we can communicate and we can find out and we can pick up telephones and cell phones and call if we need an answer and we can, we can get on a computer and find out and study and, and, and get answers to almost any Bible question. I can look up every version of the Bible that there is, I guess, and know in a few minutes exactly what it says. We live in an amazing age from that standpoint. But with much blessings like that comes much accountability. And we need to be aware that because we live in an age like that, we are accountable for using it wisely and doing well with it.
but most of all our blessings are in Christ, and that's the aim for labor and mill. You need to obey the gospel tonight. I'm going to ask you one more time to think about that vine illustration. Now, in my Bible, and I've read some other people's Bible too, it seems to say the same thing, but in Romans chapter 6, it says, Know ye not, and as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You were baptized into Christ, you were baptized in his death. I kind of added in Galatians 3.27 there too. Twice in the Bible, you are baptized into Christ. You are baptized into death. You can now put on Christ. When you were baptized into his death, you were raised to walk in newness of life. When he's making this strong emphasis on the vine and branches and says, unless you're in me, you can do nothing, then I take it real seriously as to whether or not I'm in Christ through baptism. He said, you won't accomplish anything without being in me. So get in Christ if you hope to bear fruit and if you hope to be saved. If you need to be restored to the Lord, come and let's pray with you as you repent of your sins. Let's